All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our third webinar of 2022. This is all a part of our patient ambassador program. Um, and this webinar specifically highlights lung transplants and aims to help viewers navigate their pre, post, and current transplant journeys. So first off, my name is Cece Cunningham. I am the executive director of the Chris Kluge Foundation, and I'll be introducing you to today's panelists and moderating this webinar. Uh, first, I want to take a, a moment to thank our generous sponsor, Hearts for Russ, who made this webinar series all possible. So, um, as well as our wonderful partners uh, and co-hosts today, the Second Wind Lung Transplant Association. Thank you guys. So, um, just a little housekeeping. If you're new to Zoom webinar, you'll notice that you have a Q&A box to field questions to the panelists on your council down below. We will have a brief 10 to 15 minute Q&A at the end. So we encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A box as they come to mind. Now, I'd like to introduce our panelists. <clears throat> First up, we have Samantha Rick. Sam is a two-time double lung transplant recipient and 2018 uh, Chris Kluge Foundation Bounce Back Give Back Award winner. She was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis or CF at age three, but kept her lungs healthy through her late 20s. When she was 31 years old, she underwent her first double lung transplant. She developed chronic rejection five years later and received her second double lung transplant in 2016. Right before her second transplant, Sam began working as a case manager for the alternative sentencing program under the Plumas County District Attorney's Office, helping adults in the criminal justice system transition back into society, a job that she still holds today. Uh, as a volunteer with her local Cystic Fibrosis Foundation chapter, Sam has met with California state representatives and legislators on matters related to CF and the state's healthcare programming. She is also a mentor for the Lung Transplant Foundation and a peer mentor for the CF Foundation's Peer Connect program. Sam is also an avid mountain and road biker, rock climber, and snowboarder. She has won numerous climbing competitions, and she uh, has completed the CF Foundation's 15-mile Cycle for Life bike ride and the 100-mile Breathe Bike Track in support of clean air and lung health, as well as smoking cessation programs. So thank you, Sam, for being here with us today. Uh, next up, we have Gavin Maitland. Gavin is a lung transplant recipient, <clears throat> avid athlete, and published author. After developing severe breathing difficulties in his mid-30s, Gavin was diagnosed with a rare lung condition, and he ended up requiring a life-saving lung transplant due to the extensive scarring in his lungs brought on by the disease. Um, after getting a second chance at life, Gavin decided to take on the athletic challenge of swimming from Alcatraz Island, that's right, Alcatraz Island in San Francisco, uh, to the San Francisco shore five years after his transplant to celebrate his escape from lung disease. He continues to swim competitively, including the Lady Liberty Swim in New York Harbor and the Bridge to Bridge Swim in Oakland Bridge Bay. And in 2018, Gavin published a book, Swimming Through Adversity, that recounts his inspiring journey through lung transplant. Gavin continues to donate proceeds of his book to Duke University Hospital's Lung Transplant Research Program and to organizations that support lung research and increase organ donation awareness. Thanks for being here, Gavin. Next up, we have Callie Haber. Um, Kaylee Haber, excuse me, born and raised along the shoreline of California. Kaylee has spent the last year transitioning from home into full-time traveling the continent and living in a van. So pretty cool right off the bat. Diagnosed at birth with cystic fibrosis, Kaylee maintained her health through sports and social activities. Um, despite her best efforts to balance health, career, and happiness, she found herself battling end-stage lung disease, uh, you know, meaning frequently hospitalized, sustaining nutrition through a feeding tube, breathing with the help of supplemental oxygen and BiPAP, and eventually in need of a double lung transplant. So in order to financially and mentally survive this isolating nature of her situation, she began to, her journey and her legacy chronically through her blog and now foundation, Fight to Breathe. A year after her first transplant, Kaylee experienced severe organ rejection and desperately needed a second life-saving double lung transplant. So she moved to Los Angeles and spent six months living in the hospital while awaiting her surgery. 
And since receiving her new lungs, she has lived an independent and successful life, achieving new goals every day, including being a wish grantor for the Make-A-Wish Foundation um, and public speaking for other organizations such as the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, Global Genes, One Legacy, Donate Life America, and Sick Chicks. She celebrates others by helping those who are in similar situations in any way possible. Thanks for joining us, Kaylee. And last but certainly not least, we have Tom Nate. Tom is a two-time double lung transplant survivor. Uh, he received his first transplant at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis in 2007, and then uh, re-transplanted in 2010. Tom was born with a genetic lung disease called Cart Cartagenar syndrome, I hope I got that right, which is a combination of bronchi bronchiectasis and PCD, I know I'm just butchering these words, and has the added symptom of being born with all of his internal organs being reversed. Uh, so Tom has experienced all parts of this lung transplant journey, um, including having to live outside the hospital on a portable ventilator for 18 months while awaiting his second transplant. He is currently almost 12 years post-transplant with his second set of lung, uh, second set of lungs. Today, Tom is 67 years old and owns his own property insurance inspection company. He has been married 35 years to his amazing wife and caregiver, Irma, and has a son, Joshua, who's a track athlete at Dallas Baptist University. Outside of his work, he donates his time and energy to leading Second Wind Lung Transplant Association as president, also our co-host for today. Tom is also a transplant mentor with the Lung Transplant Foundation, and him and his family reside in Bernie, Texas, where he also spends time helping the Texas Organ Sharing Alliance and Donate Life Texas. Thanks, Tom. And just a little bit more about the Chris Kluge Foundation. We are based in Aspen, Colorado. We advocate for organ, eye, and tissue donations, specifically surrounding education. So educating people of all ages, but mostly young people, about the importance of becoming an organ donor and the importance of uh, organ donation and the life-saving gift that it gives. So we'll provide all of our the links to our website, as well as the links to Hearts for Us and the Second Wind uh, Lung Transplant Association, as well as some contact info uh, in the chat. So you'll uh, feel free to uh, access those resources and let's dive into some questions. All right, first up, Sam, uh, let's talk about your experience, you know, awaiting your life-saving double lung transplant. You know, what did you, what were the emotions going on? How did you feel, especially when you received that call that they had found a match, uh, you know, to become your donor and to receive your transplant? Yeah, so the first one, um, I kind of put it off for a year. I did the testing and then kind of got too sick. I was dealing with some um, health issues with my mom and then things kind of all culminated at once. And so I wasn't on the list very long for my first one. It was just a couple months. And fortunately, I was in San Francisco when I got the call. Um, that's my transplant center. And I was with my brother and my sister who were visiting from Wisconsin. So it was kind of like everything came together at the right time. We we're just about to go over the Bay Bridge to go home and I got the call. So it was like just talking about it. I have goosebumps and all the feels, but it was perfect timing because I live about five hours away. So not having to make that drive and just being there. Um, it, it was fantastic. And having my family there with me, too, there is nothing better. So um yeah everything went really smoothly and um it was a little bit of a whirlwind because as we were leaving we were actually going back to where i live for a fundraiser for the transplant and i was really nervous about being there because i couldn't breathe well or walk or talk or any of the things um and me and one of my girlfriends had said you know, we have this feeling that you're going to get the call the day of the fundraiser. And that's exactly what happened. So it was, yeah, it was, it was pretty intense for sure. And then my second one, I, after I developed chronic rejection, I was just too sick. So I just had to wait in the hospital for new lungs to come. So yeah, that was, it was a lot different. Yeah, I'm sure. A very blessed coincidence on the first go around. Um, and, and what we're sort of, you know, going through chronic rejection, especially with the lung transplant, you mentioned being so sick and the impact that it does have on um, you and, and sort of going into this again. What were sort of the emotions? 
I mean, you met, you kind of touched on it with the waiting in the hospital and sort of everything happening so quickly. What were sort of your family's emotions or your close, uh, your loved ones, your close friends? What was sort of the general feeling? Was it sort of a sure thing or was there a lot of waiting around sort of guessing what the next, uh, what was around the next turn, I guess? Um, it's hard for me to answer like friends and family's feelings around the second one because I was so um, emotionally tapped out and mentally tapped out. I stopped accepting visitors because I just didn't have the bandwidth to handle anything else that people were going through because it, it was it was very intense and draining and it wasn't very hopeful like to be honest for sure so it was two and a half months of just waiting and hoping for the best but not really knowing especially when you're getting sick really fast so yeah it was um it was mentally very challenging for sure i'm sure yeah completely um thank you sam for sharing um and speaking on sort of the vastness of lung disease gavin i wanted to turn this over to you um you know lung disease affects approximately 16.4 million adults each year so um, sort of along a similar vein, can you talk about the impact that lung disease had on you in the lead up to your transplant and um, as well as after your transplant? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Cece. Um, first of all, I say thank you for inviting me to this panel. I think it's a fabulous idea. Thank you, Cece. And thank you to the Chris Klug Foundation. These are just marvelous, marvelous people. Um, so talking about, to answer the question, uh, the lead up to a lung transplant is just the worst. Everyone on this panel knows it. I'm also in awe of my fellow panelists. I'm only a one-time lung transplant recipient. You're all two-time recipients, and I just can't fathom how hard that is. So um, I'm just in awe of being on the same panel as you guys. Um, leading up to it, you know, you can't breathe. You're coughing incessantly. You're losing weight. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a dreadful period. For me, the sort of lead up to the transplant lasted about six or seven years, and it was just, it was just, a, it was just a horrible period of my life. It's also... I would say it's even worse for your immediate family. So my, for my wife, for my two kids who were six and eight at the time, my mom, but it's just a dreadful, dreadful time for them. And I, it's, I think it's actually worse for your immediate family than it is for yourself. Um, so the word that people often use for lung transplant I've heard and I've used myself is a roller coaster ride. And that's exactly what it is. You go up and you go down, you get something, something on the horizon, you feel slightly better, you feel worse. Um, it's kind of a difficult time to go through the the, uh, the ups and downs of the whole thing. Um, afterwards, you know, as you guys all know in the panel, it takes a while to recover from this. It's a big shock to your body. It's a big operation, um, and it just takes a while to recover. And I'm I'm really lucky. I'm still lucky. Um, I got great lungs, and uh, I'm able to do a lot of things with them. But it took me, you know, people say how long does it take you to recover? I mean. In some ways, you're st still always recovering. You're always doing things that are slightly different, slightly better. Um, but it took me probably four or five years to sort of get back to what I felt was a, a reasonable level of, of, of living. And, um, you know, I'm exceptionally lucky, 14 years out, um, and I've got great functionality and I've got no, really no restrictions. So, uh, you know, maybe I'm not a, a representative that way, but, uh, you know, I just feel lucky to be, to be here and be able to talk to a panel and, and to guests like this. Definitely, definitely. And it's, it says a lot that you are so active and um, athletic and healthy post transplant. I think it just goes to show how incredible the transplant process is, especially for um, people with lung transplants. It's the only organ that's exposed to the outside elements. So it's a very unique sort of situation within the transplant community that you all have. And I think it's really important to sort of capitalize on that and talk about how the recovery and, and the recovery yeah. process. So thank you, Gavin. I appreciate Appreciate your answer. Welcome. Um, Tom, you are a lung transplant mentor, as I mentioned, um, to candidates and patients currently going through the transplant process. After your transplants and also as working as a mentor, what have been some of your greatest sort of takeaways or experiences um, working with people uh, who were in a situation that you were once in? Uh, for me, I think the biggest, the biggest plus I get out of doing it is, uh, you know, if I've been through it twice. And uh, when I share my journey, which was quite a quite a journey, um, do it twice. Uh, 
you know, to be, especially if you can do it live, to stand in front of a transplant candidate, uh, much the way I looked at when I went my first evaluation, the last day of the evaluation, they bring in two survivors to tell you their story. That was what finally convinced me, okay, I can do this. And then for me too, I had to do it long distance, move from San Antonio, Texas to St. Louis, Missouri, where I knew nobody, you know, and uh, then did it twice. And the first time we were there six months, second time, uh, a little over two years. So um, long distance transplants is something that a lot of people fear. I know I feared it, uh, but being able to convince people, hey, you could do this. I did this. You can do this. That's what a gentleman did for me. I met him online, and uh, he could, he's, he'd been to St. Louis, done his transplant. He told me where to live, told me everything I needed to know, and everything exactly well, exactly like he told me. And so, but, but again, uh, the other part that I get the uh, plus out of is you know, I've, I lived for 18 months on a ventilator, portable vent. Uh, and I lived outside the hospital, which I was the first one at Barnes never let do that. They, in fact, they told me that I probably wouldn't live more than six months on a bit uh, because they said if I caught a cold or anything, that'd it, be it. Uh, and I just, I never got sick. I, I, I had things, but I never got truly sick. Uh, but there were days where I'd sit there and say, okay, is this what life's going to be? Do I live on this machine the rest of my life? Uh but I always talk to people and say, you know, what, what, what inspires you to do this? This is a journey that uh, it, it takes a gut check uh, mentally and physically. Uh, like Gavin said, it's really hard on your family, more so than yourself. Uh, and I had at the time of my first transplant, I had a four year old son. Well, by the time I was at my second transplant, he was six. So when I share these things with them, I always ask, I said, what, what's your motivation? Why do you want to do this? Because if you don't have a reason, to really, you know, go for it, it's going to be a really hard, hard journey. And I've seen, you know, I remember my transplant uh, pulmonologist told me when I got evaluated and approved, he said, let me tell you, he said, all I can tell you is we can maybe get you five years. He said, uh, and I've signed enough sympathy cards to know. Okay, that was a pretty eye-opening statement from him. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where there are highs and lows. Uh, a lot of I've met a lot of transplant friends over the years who are no longer with us. It is a very delicate situation. My own sister, who had the same lung disease as me, I was able to mentor her through her first transplant, and sadly, she passed away after 10 months. Uh, not for rejection or anything. It's actually a whole unrelated thing to lung transplant. She was doing well and got an infection in her liver, and it, it took her. Uh, so I know firsthand how, how it could be. Um, but I think, you know, I try so hard to do live presentations, live talks, because seeing you in the flesh, and Zoom helps, but seeing you in the flesh, they can evaluate your whole body and your movements, your actions. And uh, I, I, when I go to St. Louis for my checkups, I usually get to stay an extra two days to, be, to visit patients in the ICU, uh, especially the ones that are on ventilators. And when I show them my pictures and tell them my story, that, that really inspires them. So, you know, and uh, I, I'll share one last story. I had a lady who watched me wait for my second transplant. She had had her first. Uh, we worked out at the same time in the rehab. And you know, I drive in on my, I rode a scooter for the 18 months. So I drive on my scooter, unhook my vent, plug it in the wall, or in the, plug the oxygen in. I get on the treadmill, do my thing, and then I plug it and drive right back home. I drove four blocks every day down the hospital sidewalks. So when I finally had my second one, she was overjoyed for me. Well, it wasn't maybe a year after my second one that she contacted me and told me she was in rejection. And uh, she was considering a second transplant, but her family was totally against it. And she wanted me to try to convince her that it was the right thing to do. And that, that's really not something that any of us could do. That's an individual decision. But what I did was I basically shared my whole story, wrote it out for her, and she shared that with her family. And it totally changed their minds. They just said, yes, you need to go for it. But she had grown children, so there weren't any young children involved. Sadly, she passed away from a heart attack while waiting for the second transplant, and uh, which was sad for me. But what was amazing was about a month after she passed away, her husband called me and told me that the last month of her life was the most happy she'd been since she first got rejection because she knew where she was going, she knew what she wanted to do, and she knew they were all behind her. And he said, he really thanked me for my time to write out my story to her so that you know those type of moments those come pretty often and that's that's the rewarding part to see that you impact somebody's life uh even in you know sad times 
And so I, I, get, I get a lot of reward out of that. I'm sure, yeah. And you're touching so many different people's lives from all different backgrounds and all different health situations that it really is sort of a, a you know, one-on-one -on -one experience. Every experience is special and so different in, in its own way. So um, thank you for sharing those amazing stories. You know, it's, it's the reality of transplant. It's always, you know, sometimes, you know, we're, we have the privilege to talk, um, all of us, you know, who are, uh, you know, survivors, not me personally, but survivors of transplant. And, um, you know, you don't always get to hear that side. Um, and it's, I think it's really impactful to address it and to, um, to talk about it. I think that's the most important part. So thank you, Tom, for sharing those stories. Um, and Kaylee, I'm going to switch over to you. Um, the lung transplant process, as we've all, all mentioned, uh, is long and can feel never ending. Um, along with Sam and Tom, you are also a two time uh, double lung transplant recipient. So, you know, you go through your first transplant, everything's going well. Um, you know, what went through your mind when you learned that you required a second transplant? <laughs> Um, well, after my first transplant, I actually did have a lot of complications. And so the whole time I was kind of in and out of the hospital, I never gained weight. I was still using my feeding tube and such. And about a year after my first transplant is when I went into rejection. And I almost knew that it was coming, but I didn't realize that that meant that it was actually going to spiral into me being a second double lung transplant. So when I heard that news, the first initial thing I thought was that I just felt extreme failure towards my donor. I felt extreme guilt that, you know, I wasn't going to be able to keep his legacy through my lungs, that I was going to need another transplant and new lungs. And I also felt guilty for, you know, my loved ones. I felt like my first transplant, my hope was that I was going to become independent, that I was going to be able to live on and that, you know, I was going to basically be able to give them more freedom without having to worry about me and take care of me. And that didn't happen. And so when I was told I needed the second double lung transplant, I knew that they again were going to, you know, be by my side. My family is extremely supportive and extremely committed to my health. And I'm very, very lucky for that. Um, but I'm also sad because it means that they spend countless nights in the hospital with me. You know, they go through the same emotion, maybe not the same emotions. Um, everyone deals with things on their own, but I wouldn't say it's less than what I went through because watching a loved one, I imagine is one of the hardest things you have to do in your life. Maybe even harder than dealing it with it yourself. Um, for me personally, I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but for me, um, when I had to navigate that second double lung transplant, it was, it was difficult. At first we started with just doing steroids treatment. And after the steroid treatment, which lasted just a few days outpatient, I was told your rejection is going to be gone. I was just an A1 rejection, which basically means I was at the earliest stage of rejection. And so I was told it's going to be gone. No need to worry. And I kept asking, do I need a bronc to make sure it's you know, my rejection's gone and they insisted I didn't. And so um, I went with my transplant team, but, you know, it spiraled out of control. I got extremely sick really, really fast, which was actually more difficult to deal with than when I was dealing with cystic fibrosis, which was kind of a decade, decade long process of decline. This was basically a few months and I went from total independence to not eating anything by mouth, intractable nausea, um, feeding tube 24 seven. Um, I needed oxygen. I, I also used the scooter because I couldn't even walk around my apartment. I needed total care, including like bathroom, shower, everything, and eventually a BiPAP. And um, the hospital that I was at decided that I was too sick and I was no longer a candidate for a double lung transplant at their center. And we did one last hospitalization, a Hail Mary, and that was gonna hopefully tell us something we didn't know that could help me, you know, become a candidate or get a little bit healthier to become a candidate. So 
Um, I went in for the Hail Mary. And at the end of that hospitalization, I was basically sent home on hospice. And I went home. And at first, my husband and I were like, let's move to Hawaii. Let's bring the whole family. We can just live out as long as we have, which honestly didn't feel that long. We thought maybe a month, not even because I was so sick. And, you know, we just thought, let's just be happy. Um, But after, you know, a few hours, we were like, I don't think we can do that. We can't give up. We haven't given up yet. Let's go for it. So the first thing that I can say that we did was we researched every center around the United States. We were going, we were trying to see what were the best outcomes. We were looking at statistics and we were looking at what specialized in transplants that um, took people off ventilators because the state that I was in, I was headed towards being vented. So we thought if I travel to a center, I might need to be vented. That's what the hospital had told me. So let's look for a center that takes transplants from ventilators. Um, So we did that. And then once we kind of narrowed down which centers we thought would be the best for me, we contacted the transplant coordinators at those centers and we tried to put them in contact with my current hospital and talk to them a little bit about my, my medical history. We put together a health data package, as we called it, which meant that we took everything off of the my chart, my health chart and composited it into um, uh, documents and, and, and uh, spreadsheets, basically, and forwarded those to the, tra- to the coordinators so that they could hopefully share the doctors. And then we went through insurance. So one thing was that I was actually on state insurance at the time, which meant that I could only really choose from four hospitals in California. And um, they were not the best hospitals that I thought that I could go to at the time. And so we, um, my husband and I decided to officially get married and transfer my insurance from state insurance onto his um, work insurance, which did did mean, and we knew we were gonna have to pay a lot of money for my health insurance, but it was the only way that I could basically seek other hospitals. So we did that. And then um, we started scheduling evaluations. And so that was the biggest key. Unfortunately, I actually became too ill to actually go to evaluations. So um, that was unfortunate. I ended up being, hospitalized um, and put in the ICU. I was on a vent, or not on a vent, sorry, I was on BiPAP and I was extremely sick. And we got in contact with um, one hospital in California, UCLA. We didn't think I could travel far. And basically I contacted the doctor and showed him my support system. We FaceTimed and I was trying to share with him how committed I was to the process of a second double lung transplant. I think the biggest thing that we can do as patients is advocate for ourselves, you know, do our own research, and then also try to persuade how committed you are and how much you're willing to go through to get to that end goal, which is what I was doing. I was basically trying to show that I was positive, that I was mentally and at least somewhat physically strong enough to go through a second transplant and that I was willing to do the work however long that recovery would be and that process would be and um, we eventually ended up scheduling a life flight from my first hospital to my second hospital where I lived for five and a half months waiting for my second double lung transplant and then I got my second double lung transplant and um, I would just say if you're watching this if you're in rejection, just know, um, Tom mentioned this too, like it is possible to travel other places for a transplant and believe in yourself and believe that you can do it because the self-doubt is really what um, kind of plays a large part in our minds as people that are going through this process. So try to be as confident and as strong as you can be and lean on others when needed. I think that's all an excellent, you know, viewpoint. And really, um, I think the self-advocacy in healthcare is not very talked about. It's sort of um, something that, you know, you, you, your doctor's word is the end, end word, you know, it's not really sort of up to you and not up to the patient. But I think it's a really important point that you touched on that it's 
sort of, you know, it's your body and it's how you feel. So um, emotional, the emotional side of transplant does come into play, especially um, not just transplant, but long-term disease and going through that firsthand, you, you would know it better than anyone else, right? So I think advocating for yourself and um, having that autonomy to sort of say, you know, no, I'm here, I'm here for the long haul, I'm a fighter. So it's, I think it's very inspirational, obviously for all of somebody who is not a transplant recipient like myself to hear, but also people who are going through the frustrations that can sometimes take place with dealing with healthcare and doctors and especially um, uh, long-term disease. I think um, it's a really inspiring and um, hopeful uh, way of, of looking at it and sort of taking ownership for yourself. I think that's a really, um, really awesome thing you're doing, Kaylee. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. Um, Sam, I wanted to switch over to sort of the post-transplant side, um, I know you, you know, in your introduction, we talked about you're going for it with all these rock climbing adventures and biking competitions. So, you know, how have your lung transplants, you know, affected your, you, you've received two double lung transplants. So have those transplants affected your ability to sort of maintain this clearly healthy and active lifestyle that you uh, lead and strive to lead? But well, at first I thought it would because, you know, the nurses and doctors, I almost feel like they scare you into um, maybe not doing some certain things. You know, when I told them about all the activities I did and wanted to get back into, they, you know, had mentioned, well, you probably won't be able to rock climb anymore and you can't, you know, mountain bike because you're inhaling the dirt and all the things. But I've heard that so many times throughout my life, like you can't and you shouldn't. And so, you know, I take those types of things with a grain of salt, but I'm, I'm also a very compliant patient. Um, so because that's part of the whole process too, is like Kaylee had said, like showing that you're committed and you're going to do whatever it takes to keep the lungs healthy and go to your like post follow-up appointments, all the things, take the medications. So it's this interesting balance. Like, yeah, I'm going to do everything I need to do that I know that is going to prolong my life. But it, these activities and like going out and living my life is actually what is going to prolong my life in the sense of feeling happy about being alive and just like getting all those things. And so um, lung transplant has catapulted my activity for sure. Um, this year I started doing, um, backcountry snowboarding. I never would have been able to do that with my CF lungs. I tried, but, uh, kind of a fruitless effort and scared the people around me. <laughs> so it's nice to be able to go out there and carry all my own stuff and, you know, it, like just experience the world differently. And so I've definitely picked up a lot more activities and still rock climb, mountain bike, like crazy. Um, I've accomplished a lot of things in my active life and personal life that I just never, like never saw for myself. So that, that's, that's been very, like it's almost mind blowing in some ways because you just don't see yourself doing those things um, at, in some points in your life. And I do remember when I was in the hospital waiting for my second set of lungs and I was intubated. And so like part of me saying earlier, like I can't comment on how friends and family felt. I just wasn't there to, to see it. Um, I know it's hard on them. I see that they struggle a lot, you know? Um, and so it's, it's hard when you're not like really present to absorb that trauma that they're feeling. Um, but I do remember the last time I could talk, I was like, if I get out of here, I'm never working again. I'm traveling, I'm doing all this stuff. And then within like six months after my second transplant, I'm like, okay, hey, I want to go back to work. Like, how do I work? <laughs> so it's also just like being able to be a productive member of society, give back, still do your passions and like balance all of that after like the rug has been pulled out from under you so swiftly. Because also like Kaylee 
my decline after getting rejection was like a two month span. I lost 70% of my lung function, 40 pounds. It was just so intense. I had no way to acclimate. So, um, yeah, it kind of like throws your life into a tailspin. So just to like have that chance to like, you know, get my life back and almost start over again a third time is just, it's, it's awesome. So yeah, the lung transplants have affected everything in a positive way and just, yeah, I couldn't be more thankful. Definitely a motivating factor to sort of, um, I know if I was a transplant recipient, I'd be like, okay, time to work out, time to get out there, time to do everything you said you're putting off, you know, it's sort of, it's definitely a huge motivator. And I think, um, you know, somebody, for somebody who went through it twice, um, it's, it's a huge reason to get up every morning and to live every day. Um, like it's your last because you you know that feeling and you know what that feels like. So um, thank you for sharing, Sam. Gavin, I wanted uh, along the healthy lifestyle uh, point here, um, you know, for somebody who is trying to take up a healthy lifestyle post-transplant, from your experience, what measures or what strategy, I guess, would you suggest to help them remain safe and conscious of their transplant while also pursuing these physical activities um, that, you know, doctors may not uh, strongly advise or, you know, just an active lifestyle in general? Yeah, good question, Cece. Uh, two things I would say are really important in my, in my opinion. Number one, as Sam, Samantha was just saying, be compliant. You know, whatever your doctors say, my policy is whatever they tell me to do, I do it. I take all my meds on time. I take the right quantities. I do my follow-up visits. Um, everything they say, tell me to do, I do it. Uh, number two is exercise. And I find this has been really helpful for me. You know, initially when you come out of the transplant, they have you walking in a little track and you get up and walk around your bed and you do little things to, to get in your lungs moving. Um, and I was admittedly very tentative for the first few days, weeks, months after my transplant, but I got back into the groove fairly quickly. Um, my story is about, uh, you mentioned at the beginning, the Alcatraz swim, and as Tom mentioned, you know, somebody along the line will tell you there's this five-year you know, window or five-year horizon that you're heading towards. This is the average, they say. Maybe it's higher now, maybe it's six years, but the average says the your survival rate is not good as a long transplant recipient. When I was getting close to my five-year anniversary, I was about no, maybe four years out, I was thinking I wanted to do something. And I hadn't really got back. When I was at college and, and high school, I used to be a swimmer, competitive swimmer. And I thought over the years, I just sort of let that all lapse, you know, working and kids and everything else. And I thought, well, why don't I just get back to swimming? So I checked my doctor, first thing she always do. And the doctor said, no, 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 don't, don't swim. Swimming's terrible. You know, it's all the bacteria in the pool and, you know, even worse than in a lake or you know, it's just awful. So my next follow-up visit, I got a different doctor. I said, what about swimming? And he goes, yeah, you could try it. Just, just, you know, just be careful and, you know, you just, just be sensible about it. So I thought, okay, there's the green light. So I started swimming. I went to the local pool. I started uh, doing my training and, you know, my swimming at that point was like lying on my back and kicking my legs. But I got, I got back into it eventually. So I set my sights on Alcatraz just because I'd heard about it. I used to, I watched the Clint Eastwood movie from the seventies, Escape from Alcatraz. I thought, wouldn't that be cool if I could do that? And apparently it's a thing, right? So you find it online. There's people do it all the time. Um, so I told my family one dinner time, listen, I want to do Alcatraz, swim Alcatraz. It's not, it's not as bad as it sounds. It's 1.2 miles straight line, right? Okay, it sounds like it's 20 miles. It's not, it's, it's only it's over a mile. Um, if you can swim in a straight line. But I said to my family, this is what I want to do. I want to swim Alcatraz. And but they also looked at me like, okay, that's one of his crazy ideas. But my, my son, who at that time was 13, he says, well, if you're doing it, I'm going to do it. And my son was a, 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 a swim team swimmer. I'm like, come on, you can't swim Alcatraz. It's really cold. There's sharks. There's, you know, currents. It's really, you know, it's terrible. He goes, no, 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 if you're doing it, I'm doing it. And then my daughter, who was sitting there as well, she was 11, two years younger than my son. She goes, well, if he's doing it, I'm doing it. And I'm like, no, 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 hold on a second. You can't, we can't all do this. This is, this is crazy. But we did. We all started training. We all sort of got together as a family. I had this very specific goal. And, you know, all three of us did it, you know, on Mother's Day in 2013, which is my wife still reminds me to this day. She spends Mother's Day on a boat while our family are like swimming in the open sea. But it's, it, was, it was a great experience. And more than that, it's like it's setting a goal, setting a specific goal for yourself to get to the next point, the next milestone. 
Um, and I think that's really important as well, having personal goals. I mean, I think Jaylee said that, Sam said that, you know, Tom said that. Realizing what your motivation is and how you can set a goal. If you set a goal, um, there's really nothing can get in your way to, to meet, reach that goal. And it's a really healthy way of, of living, I think. Uh, it's helped me a lot. And i am always got the next goal, the next thing going on. For me, I use exercise quite a lot, but I also use professional goals and work goals and other things. I mean, for a long time, because my kids are so young, I had my transplant, six years old, my daughter, eight years old, my son. Um, my goal was to be alive until they graduate from high school. Um, so last weekend, my son graduated from college. So now I'm thinking, well, I've swept past that goal, so I better set some more goals. Um, um, but that, you know, that's a good way to live. I, I ran a half marathon last October with my daughter. She's at college and University of Richmond in, in Virginia. We did that together in, in, in Richmond. Um, you know, just having a goal is a really good thing to motivate yourself. So I would advise anyone who's going through any difficulty to set a goal, no matter how Un unlikely the goal is, you know, set a crazy stretch goal for yourself and you'll be amazed how, how you can, how you can reach it. Definitely. I think that's always looking towards the long term. I think is, is a key um, in all of this. And it's a common thread between everyone who's spoken today. So um, thank you for sharing, Gavin. I can't believe you did that swim. I know you say it's no big deal. It's, you know, 1.2 miles or whatever, but it's, it's really impressive, especially, you know, with the lung capacity and being able to hold your breath. I'm sure that all comes into play. Um, but it really is inspiring to hear um, as somebody who is not in the transplant community, not somebody who's received a, a lung transplant but um just a normal person here just yeah. listening to it is like geez that's that's pretty pretty cool so um, pe people say oh yeah the, the big thing about the swim is my last point is it, it what about the sharks right and i say there's no sharks in the bay right the, the sharks don't go into the bay they just don't but like, no there's great whites in the bay i'm like no one's ever been attacked by a great white in san francisco bay it's never happened so that was 2013 right if you look at youtube and you put in Great white shark, sharks in San Francisco Bay. A whole bunch of videos come up of great whites in the bay. So, um, you know, I stand corrected on that point, but we didn't know that until after we done the swim just as well. But, you know, oh you've got to weigh up things, lung transplant, great white shark attack. You know, it's all relative. Oh, wow. Well, um, let's say you, you survived it. I think that's the most important part, transplant or not. <laughs> um, thank you, Gavin, for sharing. Um, Kaylee, uh, I sort of mentioned in your introduction, you know, you are really have turned into a force for the transplant community um, through your social media and your social media presence. Um, what inspired you to sort of launch this presence on social media and um, what sort of inspired you to sort of share your story with others? Yeah, so to be honest, when I first talked to my uh, lung transplant team about um, getting a lung transplant and being listed. At the time, really my only support system that I had was my mom. Uh, my dad and my mom recently got separated. My family was kind of in shambles. And so I just had my mom by my side. Um, and I think they knew that and they saw that my mom was working, trying to be there with me, but it's really impossible to do everything as a one single mother. And, um, and so they got to me, you know, you're going to need two, two caretakers. And I was like, okay, well, I have one really good one. And they're like, no, you need two caretakers. They need to be able to be there full time for you after your lung transplant for the recovery. And I was like, well, how long do you think that process is for two full-time caretakers? And they said about three months. So um, then I was like, okay, well, what's, you know, what's their duties? What's that going to entail? And they told me that it was going to be full time, meaning they couldn't work. They were going to need to be by my side at all times there to help me, you know, everything. And so um, I kind of was like, well, that's going to be impossible in my situation. Um, but of course, nothing's impossible. You know, you can always make something happen. And so that you know, catapulted this presence of social media kind of unexpectedly for me. I, my brother moved to San Francisco. He became my second caretaker and really my main care, caretaker while my mom was working to support all three of us. And so we said, okay, I have two full-time caretakers. Now we need, you know, the financial stability to be able to support all three of us for three months after the recovery or during the recovery. So um, I built 
my own um, website and I was like, okay, well, let me fundraise for this. I've fundraised it before for lots of other organizations. And so um, that kind of led into the social media. I kind of saw the social media as a way to share with my family and friends what I was going through. And so that's kind of all I thought it would be. And hopefully, you know, that would inspire some people to help my family and maybe give a dollar, give $2, something like that to just help us. Um, but over time, I started to really share my feelings and share what I was going through more than just, you know, my first ever post just said x-ray. That's it. With just an x-ray photo. And I started writing and writing became my way to kind of process what I was going through. It became very therapeutic. And um, I think that, you know, sharing a story with a community is so important because we're all really learning from one another. At least that's how I feel when I'm reading other people's stories. And so it, it gives me information. It educates me. It allows me to then take that information to my care team and kind of be like, okay, well, you know, I saw this person had, you know, um, X and now I've researched X and I actually think it's a good possibility for my health. Can, wh what do you think about it? And they're like, oh, well, you know, I didn't think about that for you, but now that you bring it up, yeah, let's try it. So I really think it is educational to listen to people's stories for your healthcare and also for your emotional state of going through what you go through every day as a chronic illness patient, as a, you know, lung transplant patient, whatever process or stage that you're in. So I really urge people to share more of their stories, not only to help others, but to kind of process it in their own way. And um, just get through it in a positive way as well. Definitely. I think we're seeing a lot with just social media in general uh, about, you know, you're not alone in this, in this situation and you have others who are going through very similar situations. And I think having that voice and being able to reach and touch so many people with your story, I think creates a really, um, really great common ground, especially for people going through such an unfamiliar uh, and uncertain uh, process uh, that is, you know, the lung transplant process. So Kaylee, I think what you're doing is amazing. Thank you for, for sharing. And um, before we get into the Q&A, very quickly, Tom, I wanted to sort of touch on the Second Wind Lung Association. Um, you are the president of the association. So um, if you could just tell us a little bit more about what that organization does, um, specifically for lung transplant recipients and candidates. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you for having me for this uh, webinar. I really appreciate that. And we're proud to co-sponsor it. Um, Second Wind was formed in uh, 1995 by a group of lung transplant patients out of St. Louis. And uh, the goal was to try to enhance or improve the quality of life for lung transplant survivors. And uh, through information, uh, through uh, email support, uh, we have a financial assistance program, uh, which is not really for big ticket, you know, items, but there can be assistance for, you know, hotel stays, um, medications, things of that nature. And uh, membership is free currently. And uh, we're always looking for great uh, candidates. You know, uh, we're in a transition time right now. I, I've been president for almost two years. In the last uh, 13 months, four of my board members, all of them lung transplant survivors have passed away, a couple of them very suddenly. And so we, it's really hit a shock to us. But uh, you know, we're still committed to doing what we, what we need to do to uh, basically you know, enhance the education for lung transplants. That's, we have a, an Airways newsletter, which is really a, a great newsletter. Uh, it's always packed full of articles, not only of, of stories of transplant survivors, but also what's going on with the latest rejection medications, or maybe it has something to do with COVID. We, uh, our Airways editor is really great at finding information that's out there that maybe you won't see in regular news spread or on the news. You, it's something he, he has a knack for finding those things. So it's really uh, it's, it's providing information and then support our email support group as for our members only. But that's uh, we do have a Facebook page as well. Uh, but the email support group is where you, you know maybe you can ask more private type questions that you wouldn't want to put on Facebook where even as a private group on Facebook, there's a lot of people that see it. Well, our email support group is a bit smaller and more uh, refined and uh, Feel free, people feel free to ask questions they might not want to ask on Facebook. So 
Uh, but it's a, it's a great organization. I've been part of it. Actually, uh, uh, we have a national organization was our president of. We also have a local chapter. When it was first formed, the idea was to maybe have a chapter near all the major transplant centers. And they did start one in St. Louis. There's a local chapter in St. Louis that operates on its own, separate from us. Uh, I was part of that while I was in St. Louis. So, uh, but, uh, and again, we interact. Uh, we also share, we used to have a transplant mentor program, but uh, once I joined the Lung Transplant Foundation and what was part of their program, I realized that they had a lot more to offer than we did. So we basically transitioned and refer all of our mentoring patients over to the Lung Transplant Foundation. So we partner with things with them as well on that. So, uh, but you know, it, it's, uh, the organization has afforded me a way to be involved in more things. Uh, uh, I'm part of a BOS study group right now that uh, is looking at uh, obviously uh, hopefully cures for rejection, which is the one thing that we all don't like to talk about. Um, uh, also part of an international group that uh, uh, through the Lung Transplant Foundation, actually through, uh, it's another company out of uh, Italy that uh, we basically just share information and ideas between countries. It's amazing. This is what the first call I was on was about three months ago. Uh, people from all over the world, transplant patients. And one thing it reaffirmed to me is that we, whatever you hear on the news and the media and all the stuff you hear to jump today, we have the greatest healthcare system in the world. There is no doubt in my mind when I hear what goes on, transplant patients in England or Australia or Italy or Portugal, wherever they were, uh, they're, they're still somewhat behind us. Uh, in fact, some of them quite a ways behind us. So and I'll give you an example. Uh, I met a lady from Portugal who uh, is in rejection from her first transplant. She's only 29 years old. And they don't have home spirometry for them to do in Portugal. So she has to wait once every three months to go to her transplant center, which is three hours away, to get a test for her spirometry. Well, I know just like uh, some of the others have talked about, when you went in rejection waiting for the second transplant, I spiraled down the same way. Within a couple of months, I lost probably 60 to 70% of my lung function. It was so fast. And, and for her, you know, I heard that. I, I said, that's just un unbelievable. So we we put her in contact with some locals uh, here in the States that could probably send her a home kit on her own. And, uh, and I think this company was going to fund it for her as well. So those type of things you get to do, and that's that's rewarding. It really is. And second wind has afforded that to me in many ways. It, that it's very impressive. Everything that um, you've done, especially uh, with second wind, but also within the larger transplant community. And we're very thankful to have you guys as our co-hosts you know, and sponsors. Today. I will. Uh, I will add one more thing. We do have sure. a website, uh, secondwind.org, and we have all of our back issues of our newsletters there. So anybody that wants to read transplant stories and experiences. Uh, we have back issues going back several years. And there's generally a story in every issue of someone. I'm in one of them, I think from August of last year. So, but you can go and, and uh, the website tells you how to apply for financial assistance and get involved. So uh, obviously that's free. And it's second wind spelled uh, www.second spelled two nd win.org. So just want to throw that in, little plug. Yes, of course. And um, I've included those links um, for reference to everyone in the chat. So um, if anyone would like to go check that out, that's all available. Um, I think now we should probably get into our Q&A before, uh, before we close up here. Um, the first question we had was directed towards Kaylee. Um, how did you manage the feeling, you know, you mentioned that feeling of guilt, um, you know, that you felt with towards your donor with your first transplant after you went into rejection. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? What sort of got you through that little um, sort of emotional hump that you uh, faced uh, going through rejection after your first transplant? Well, to be honest, I think that this is an ongoing process for me. I don't think that I ever really will be totally free of guilt. Um, but I don't think that I actually started to feel a positive way towards, you know, having to get a second transplant until I basically was in recovery from my second transplant and knew that I had, you know, the, I was going to live and at least for the process or the time that I had then. Um, so I think writing for me helped. I've said this before, you know, starting to write for a blog, putting it on my website, um, social media's fight to breathe. And I just kind of get through a lot in my life through writing. 
I also do art. I just find things that make me happy to kind of find, like use them as therapeutic way in therapeutic ways. Um, but I also would say that I think that, you know, fighting to live on is a way to kind of get through that guilt, not giving up, but keep continuing to fight, getting a second transplant, fighting for that second transplant as well, and living and doing things now, just like Sam is, you know, being athletic, Sam, Tom, they're, they're doing these like crazy accomplishments that they never thought they'd be able to do, which is, I've had the same experience this last year. I've skydived, snorkeled, um, rode a bike, hiked, like summited mountains, rock climbed, like all these things that I really didn't see for my life again. Um, and I think that's a way to just honor both of your transplants and, or your donors and really every organ donor out there because um, being an organ donor, like is just such a selfless gift to people that otherwise would die. I'm sorry, I'm like tearing up right now, but like, like we wouldn't have the chance to be around our families and our friends and selfishly, that's what we all want. We want to be there for, you know, our brother, sister, kids to get married, graduate, like um, Tom said from high school or whatever it is, have grandkids. And um, I think just living on is a way to honor your, both your donors or any donor that you have. I think that's an excellent, excellent way of putting it and um, living life every day um, as, as if your donor is watching. Um, I think that's, that's a really beautiful way to, to say that. Um, uh, turning, turning a little bit to the next question we have here. This one's more of a relevant, uh, in terms of time, time relevancy. How did you all deal with COVID as lung transplant recipients? Um, you know, obviously it's a respiratory illness. So, um, how did you all deal with COVID and how did, how did the pandemic and the restrictions of the pandemic affect your lifestyle? Anybody can just chime in. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I've been socially distancing since my transplant, so this wasn't a new concept to me, but I just keep a really low profile, you know, I stay away from people who are sick, which I did before, you know, I wash my hands all the time, which I did before, use Purell, which I did before, so, you know, you're more conscious of it, certainly, but it's a lot of things I was already doing. Yeah, I, I was the same way, I felt like, well, it wasn't really a change, I mean, wearing a mask was something we were used to doing, um, and I, I, I kept working. I mean, uh, I think it was the initial two weeks when they had the shutdown. I was I stayed home, but I work outdoors pretty much all the time. I'm never really inside. Uh, I inspect homes and buildings and ranches and farms. And uh, after COVID started, there was no more interior inspections at all. So I was outside totally. And uh, and I, I went to my local doctor, my my primary care doctor, and sat down with him and said, "Okay, I said, I'm going to be out in the elements." And he, he had a regimen right away. He said, the key is you get to me within 24 hours of getting a symptom. He said, we'll test you. He said, I've already got a regimen. He said, if we get to it quickly, so I, you'll be fine. And so that gave me the security to know, hey, I've got a plan. So I, I worked all day. I was, I never slowed down. I kept going. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, in fact, uh, I'd go to the grocery store. My wife hates grocery shopping. So I'd put all the masks and go to the grocery store. I'd do all the grocery shopping. So, you know, my, my, uh, a pulmonologist when I left, he's retired now. When I left after the second transplant, he came to me and I went, my story is pretty, pretty harrowing. I, I, I did almost die in January of 09. And my wife, thankfully, was the advocate that kept me alive. But uh, uh, when I got ready to leave, he walked up to me in his Georgia Southern draw and he said, well, you've been through hell, son. He said, uh, don't go home and live in a bubble. Go live your life. He said, damn it. He said, just live your life. It's okay. So that's what I've done. I've lived my life. And that's it's, you know, it's, it's hard because you, you worry about all things that can happen. You've already been through it. You're scared to death that it's going to happen again. My wife is still scared. Here, 12 years later, she's still, tomorrow, she thinks I get rejection. Yeah, that could happen. But you can't live your life worried about that. Tomorrow, I could die in a car wreck. So it's like, you just got to keep going, you know. And I think that's, I, I work on mentoring patients so many, because I have so many patients I mentor who are scared to death to even go out of their house sometimes. You know, it's just, they just worry so much about that. You just can't, you know. <laughs> Uh, but I, you know, again, that's a, that's a good point that, that uh, Kaylee brought up. We just, you know, I have a guilt. I get guilt sometimes when I lose transplant friends. You know, I mean, it's just like, okay, why am I still here? My sister passed away. 
all the people who were transplanted around me in St. Louis about the same time, they're all gone and I'm still here. You know, and so I question that every time I have a friend that dies, okay, I'm still here, you know. <laughs> and all I know to do is like Kaylee said, you just gotta go out and do the things that you do to honor your daughter and honor your fellow transplant patients because they would want you to live. They would want you to do that. I I totally agree with Gavin as far as like losing friends. I mean, I'm just 30 now and I went to a transplant sort of camp um, like a decade ago and I was really young. I was 19. And um, when I got there, there was a visual one of the nights and the older patients in their 30s or 40s, 50s, you know, we were supposed to write down names on a note card and then we would kind of honor our friends who had passed away by reading the name. And uh, when I came, I thought, you know, I'm 19. I had three friends who passed away and wow, that's so many people, more people than most of my friends know and, and things like that. And when I got there, they had stacks of note cards, stacks, couldn't even get through all the names. And it was a real realization to me that, um, you know, we, we all, I think, deal with this kind of like survivor's guilt thing. But if we sat there and kind of mourned all day long, of course, there's an initial grieving process. But if we mourned all day long, every single day for the rest of our lives, what's the point of us being the ones who survived? You know, we have to go out, live life, and our friends would want that. I mean, if I passed away, I would certainly want everybody on this panel, as well as everyone out there who's had any sort of organ transplant to live on and live happy and not even second have a second thought about how, you know, have survivor's guilt from, for me. And so I try to think about that and um, live life like that. And then I would just add to the, the COVID thing. So when COVID first happened, um, my husband and I decided to totally shut down. We stayed home. We moved out of the city, out of an apartment into a condo um, in a suburb and we didn't do any shopping. We had all our groceries delivered, didn't go out, didn't see anybody. And that was for a year and a half. Um, and then the wildfires happened in California and we were just trying to shut all the doors, you know, shut the vent. And try fire. I woke up and my throat from flame. And I thought if my throat is feeling this way, my lungs have got to be feeling the smoke we need to leave. So we packed a bag and we're like, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? We can't stay with friends and we're scared to stay in hotels. And my friend said, well, there's this, there's this company, you rent a van and just travel in it. And why don't you guys just do that? You can sleep in the van. You don't have to go anywhere. And we're like, okay, sure. So that kind of initially put us into the thought of, you know, our whole, pro our whole motivation to keep going was travel and experience and be with our loved ones. But we're just sitting at home right now. And yeah, sure, we may feel safe, but that's not really living, at least the way that I want to live. And if I got went into rejection tomorrow, I probably would regret that a little bit personally. And so um, we, you know, bought a van, renovated it, and now we're traveling the continent. And I would just say, as long as you're doing the stuff like you're supposed to be doing anyways with the mask, the hand sanitizer, you know, six feet apart, not shaking hands, doing any of that stuff, like it is pretty safe. I just got COVID last month for the first time. Um, and I got through it, you know, we're traveling now because there are lots of therapies and lots of medications for us. So be reassured in those medications and your care team. And definitely if you have any symptom, no matter how small, even fatigue tests, do a home test, go get a test, do anything like that and just reassure yourself. So you're not questioning and thinking and all of that stuff. And I can just answer real quick. Um, I, same type of thing. I mean, we know how to deal with viruses. Like we've kind of been doing the same, this our whole lives. So it wasn't much of a change. I almost took just a big sigh. Like, yes, now everyone else gets to see what it's like. It was great. I loved it. Like I just spent so much time outside all day, all the time. It was such a great way to connect with my husband again and just like be outside. Um, and then like Kaylee said, when the wildfire started, I live in Quincy and that was the Dixie fire. So the biggest fire 
in California. It was intense. So then it took outside away. So that was the hardest part for me, the isolation of, okay, I can't go indoors. Now I can't go outdoors. That was like my little crazy point. But um, yeah, it was just kind of like living felt a little easier almost because everyone was like, you know, helping each other out in that way. Like, well, not everybody, but yeah, it, it seemed a little easier for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everyone's in the same boat, uh, even without a lung transplant, <laughs> sort of everyone was sort of, you know, dealing with the, that life and death sort of situation with the uncertainty and all of that. So thank mm-hmm. you guys all for sharing, um, your perspectives. Um, the last question, and I'll, I'll get to this super quick. Um, Doug asks, he says, amazing stories, all of you, simply amazing, such a pleasure to hear them. I have a question about your engagement with organ procurement organizations or OPOs. Do you feel the lung transplant community is given the same level of support, you know, advocacy, commitment as other uh, organ or organ transplant uh, recipients, like uh, recipients of a heart, kidney, liver? Um, And if there are issues, how have you worked to overcome any of these gaps? Uh, I know where I'm at, uh, we have an organization called Texas Organ Sharing Alliance, and that, they pretty much govern all of the organs transplanted uh, throughout all of South Texas, basically. And uh, I know from being involved with them, I've done a lot of talks for them. They give equal time to all organs. I mean, they really do. Uh, I've met a number of heart transplant patients and uh, uh, liver patients, uh, you know, kidney patients. So. It's, 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 there's not any favoritism in any way that I could tell. And even uh, I joined a support group at University of Texas uh, Medical Center. They have a lung transplant program there. And you know, whereas in St. Louis, we have specific support groups for each organ. At UT, they just do one general support group that has all the organs. And it took a while to get used to that, but again, and they rotated the coordinators. So one meeting, you'd have a heart coordinator, the next meeting, you'd be a lung coordinator. So they, it, it, to me, there's, there's I didn't see, I've never seen any favoritism. I really haven't. And uh, that's been the, the good thing about it because we're all, we're kind of all in a common fraternity. We've all had organ transplants. It's just that ours lungs happen to be a bit more challenging and delicate than the others. That's, you know, that's the main thing. So, but I, I've never seen the favorite, at least not here where I'm at. Yeah. And I would just say like, it's unfair almost to say that one organ has more of a focus than others only because you know with kidneys you can have a living donor you can actually keep them alive longer than you can lungs so lungs particularly are is a little bit more complicated because you know there's so many tests that have to be passed in order to you know have the donor approved to even have that organ donated because they have to be healthy and working and it also has to be within like a short amount of time to get to the recipient so there's just so many, you know, hoops to jump in lung transplant. And so that's my only comment for it. Uh, yeah, I, I think we have time for one quick question, Gavin. I was actually just pulling up your um, your link to your book just because somebody asked about the, um, the book that you had, Swimming Through Adversity. Um, uh, an anonymous uh, attendee asks, are, uh, Gavin, you mentioned you're an author. Are your books about uh, your transplant journey? Yes, I'm not very imaginative, so that's all I could think about to write. So yeah, they're both about transplant. I did one right after the year after my transplant and one in 2018, but yeah, the board work transplant. Well, I just included that in the chat for everyone. And oh, uh, Kaylee, I wanted to include your uh, your website, fighttobreathe.org, also in the chat for anyone. Um, and um, so that was that was the webinar. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, this webinar uh, is recorded and will be posted on our website, chriskluckfoundation.org, as well as um, on our YouTube page. And we'll be sharing those on our social media pages. So um, if you have any questions that weren't addressed or answered in today's webinar, please don't hesitate to contact us. Our info is in the chat, but uh, just a reminder, info at chrisklugfoundation.org. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about any of our organization, the Chris Klug Foundation, Hearts for Us, our sponsor, um, any other organizations mentioned today, we've also included all of those links in the chat. 
Um, and I think if that's it, uh, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you, Bye. Bye.